Good morning. We welcome you to our class on the prison epistles. We're in Ephesians. We're going to be starting in the fifth chapter in just a few minutes. But before we get started in class, as part of our Lads to Leaders program, Casey Taylor is in both year-round speech and year-round song leading, and so we're going to allow him time to practice one of his speeches and also to lead a song before we get started in class. Casey? A highly educated man once said he could speak 10 different languages. This is an amazing feat. Some of us have a hard time speaking one language. In school, we have to learn a second language, such as Spanish or French. It's not easy, but a second or third language can be useful. The Bible has a special language also. The Bible is written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. But that's not the language which I'm referring to. The Bible has a language of victory. Let me illustrate by quoting a few verses. I can do all, all things through Christ which strengthens me. Our God will fight for us. God is our refuge and strength and very present help in trouble. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Did you hear the common theme in those verses? God is trying to motivate his people to victory. God is trying to motivate us to victory. Motivation is a powerful tool. Coaches use it all the time to get the players to go the extra mile, to motivate the players to prepare hard and win. Sometimes the extra effort makes a difference in winning and losing. If one motivated properly, they can accomplish great things. Teachers and parents use motivation. It is amazing if one is motivated what he or she might do. Brother Basil Overton wrote a book called Mule Musing. He tells a story about a prospector out west in the 1800s. The prospector came riding into town on his faithful mule. When he got off the mule, a town bully began to shoot into the ground around the prospector's feet and tell him to dance. The prospector said, I don't dance. But the bully insisted he dance anyway as, as the shooting continued. About that time, the bully's gun ran out of bullets. Whereupon the, the prospector pulled out a saddlebag, a big long point in it, a big long pistol and pointed at the face of the, of the bully and said, Have you, did you ever kiss a mule? The bully said, no, but I've always wanted to. This is interesting how we can be motivated. God motivates us to win victory over sin, life, and death. His greatest motivational tool is his son, Jesus. John 12 through 32 says, And I, if I be lifted upon, upon from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus was lifted up by his miracles. The healing of the sick, blind and lame, convinced the multitudes that Jesus was more than a merman. But Jesus was lifted up on the cross of Calvary. Jesus, in his death, was the ultimate motivation. His humble suffering for our sins can touch even the hardest heart. That someone will die for me penetrates the depths of being. Later, John the Apostle would write, We love him because he first loved us. God and Jesus showed us true love first. We naturally respond to such sacrificial love. That love draws us out of ourselves to live for him. There is more to the story. Jesus was not only lived to motivate us, but he was raised from death to have victory. Death was more than death has no more power over Jesus. He conquered death once and for all. Paul the Apostle wrote, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but a li a li alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because we have faith in Jesus and his victory, we can also have victory. Our victory is not of self but in Jesus. We sing a, sing a song that can't that is based on verse two in Galatians. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, and I gave Himself for me. That pretty well sums it up. God motivates me to live the Christian life through His Son. God wants us to motivate others. We desire to please God do his will but god wants more god uses us to motivate others let me show you two ways he uses us first we motivate others by living right before them matthew 5 16 says let your light so shine before men that you may see that you may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven my doing what is right in front of my friends can lead them to the same victory i have it can be very contagious 
My classmates and friends can be influenced to serve the Lord by my faithfulness. My attendance in worship, my study of God's word, and my service to others leads others to victory. Second, we motivate others by the words of encouragement. I have received several words of encouragement to do a speech such as I am doing now. My mentors tell me I can do it. They continually praise me and others. Those provoke men to love and good works. Often the Bible says exhort one another, encourage one another. You can do it. A little encouragement can be the difference in a young person's struggle to live godly. Have you encouraged a fellow Christian lately? Have you ever washed a rental car? Probably not. Why don't we wash rental cars? They don't belong to us. We wash cars that do belong to us. God promises victory over the world by faith, but that faith must be personal. It cannot be the faith of mother, dad, or grandparents, for faith motivates us to victory. It must be my faith in Jesus and God. Do you have faith in Jesus to motivate you to victory? Uh, would you please turn your songbooks with me to 957, 957, This World Is Not My Home, verses 1 and 3. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. The sound the sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Once again, we welcome you to our class this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, thank you very much. We look forward to getting to know you better and hope you'll uh, continue to come back and, and visit with us every opportunity that you have. Uh, I know that we want to continue to remember Brother JT and Scott Floyd in our prayers. They're scheduled to be traveling back tomorrow. We're looking forward to having them back and, and hearing their missionary report. Uh, we need to uh, continue to remember Shelton Burroughs. That's Ann Stevens' son-in-law that was in the industrial accident uh, in our prayers. We're certainly glad that Brother Chopper Taylor is back with us after a period in the hospital. Uh, Joel Cupper. Uh, has been moved to the Mississippi Care Center, room 207A. Stanley Williams, that's Leanne Grisham's uh, dad, is home with hospice. Uh, Dorothy Hester, uh, still recovering at home. Angie Livingston, that's the daughter of Les and Regina Croson. 
uh, had a mass found in her brain and the diagnosis uh, has not been complete yet. And we need to continue to remember uh, Cassie Stewart in our prayers. Are there others that we need to be remembering this morning? Michelle Holcomb uh, is in the Tupelo Hospital. You know, she had a procedure to help uh, stop seizures, and evidently that procedure did not work because they have started again. Would you bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your blessings. And we are thankful, Father, for J.T. Beard and Scott Floyd and their willingness to go into the mission field. And we pray that you would give them safety on their travel back to us. Uh, Father, we pray that you would be with Michelle Holcomb, with Shelton Burroughs, uh, with uh, Stanley Williams, Dorothy Hester, Angie Livingston, Cassie Stewart, and we're so thankful, Father, for Brother Chopper Taylor's good recovery. We ask your blessings to be with us, Father, in this class today. Uh, help everything that we do to be consistent with your word and pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We were in uh, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 two weeks ago. Uh, last week we got to enjoy a fine lesson from Mike Eaton. And now we're back to Ephesians. You know, we were in the part of the outline that talks about a call to walk in purity. We had covered the walk not as the other Gentiles and walk in love. Uh, we're starting into walk as children of light and walk as wise in chapter 5. We were, and then we're planning today to continue on to look at a call to walk in harmony that begins in verse uh, 22 of chapter 5 and goes through verse 9 of chapter 6 and deals with husbands and wives and parents and children and masters and servants. I'd like for us to go back and read uh, Ephesians 18 through 21. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. We were ready for question 12 in your outline and explain how verse 19 teaches against instrumental music in worship. Would anybody care to address that topic? Well, it tells what you're supposed to do and what are you supposed to do. Sing and make melody in your heart. I've got several uh, comments on that a little bit later in this lesson. But uh, just, just for now, that make melody, when you look at the definition of that word... It's got several definitions, uh, and one of the unique things about that, it's talking about plucking strings, and it, usually when that word is used, then what modifies that word is used after that, so it'll tell you what strings to pluck. And in this case, we're to make melody in our heart. Based on one of the definitions of making melody to touch the chords of the human heart, that is to sing, to celebrate with hymns of praise coupled with the early church fathers only using a cappella music, we conclude that making music refer, refers to plucking the heart strings. Question number 13 is when we give thanks in prayer, we pray to whom? The Father, in the name of whom? The name of His Son or the name of Jesus Christ. 
You know, if you've looked at the prayers that are recorded in the New Testament, especially Paul's prayers, very seldom does he, in what is written, uh, say that we need to pray or, or show us by example that he prayed in Jesus' name. The multitude of his prayers are just the, the body of the prayer. But here, he's given some specific instructions about praying to the Father and praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.21, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, mark your calendar for Tuesday, not Wednesday, of the week of Thanksgiving. As has been our tradition in the last few years, we will plan on having a Thanksgiving devotion and trying to follow the instructions given here in Ephesians 5 verse 20. Now, we read verses 19 through 21. I think we started with 18. I'd like for you to discuss the vertical and the horizontal aspects of worship instructions in verses 19 through 21. By vertical, I'm talking about going upward to God. By horizontal, I'm talking about how we deal with each other. And worship is both vertical and horizontal. Go back and look at verses 19 through 21 and tell me anything that you saw in there that were instructions that would be vertical worship, worship to God. Did you see anything that said we, how we are to worship God in verses 19 through 21? You probably couldn't hear what uh, Sister Sue said up here on the front, but she'd gone through there and picked those out. I'm going to just show you a chart that I, that I tried to put together, and I think it's exactly what she said when it dealt with talking to the Father. But before I show you what she said on talking to the Father, what did it say about horizontal worship or how we deal with one another. Did you see anything in the worship instructions about one another there? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. Can you think of a song where we speak to one another? Love one another. Can you think of another where we speak to one another, where we're giving instructions? Angry words, yeah. Angry words is a very good example of that. I was looking here at the vertical and the horizontal. The vertical, or speaking to one another, also vertical, not vertical. I've got horizontal and vertical mixed up here. I've got, flick those titles, no wonder that looks odd. Vertical is supposed to be to God, and I've got the, the headings backwards there. But we're, when we're talking to one another, we're singing and making melody when we're talking to God, we're singing and making melody to the Lord. We're giving thanks to God the Father, and we're in the fear of God the Father. We're submitting to one another, and we're speaking to one another. Isn't it would be really hard to, to worship God if we come into the worship service and we're fussing with one another, or we're feeling bad about one another. We're going to sit on that side of the auditorium because somebody we can't talk to is on this side of the auditorium. What do you think about God's going to think about us if we act like that? We're not following instructions. Now I'd like to just go back and talk a little bit about the instrumental music that we uh, studied about there earlier. You know, in, in New Testament times, there, there was a change that occurred. You think about Jesus. Jesus... When he went into the temple, when he went into the synagogue, he experienced Jewish worship. And Jewish worship from uh, the time of David all the way up to through the time of Christ working, worshiping here on earth involved instrumental music. If you want to uh, look at instrumental music being commanded by God in worship, 
Go to the very last psalm, and it'll give you a lot of detail about specific instruments. So, to me, it's a very significant thing when you find that in the New Testament church, they did not use instruments of music because everybody that was converted, whether they were converted from Judaism or they were converted from paganism, had come from worship that involved instrumental music. And so you're going along in history and everybody's enjoying instrumental music and the church is established there in Acts chapter 2 and wham! Instrumental music stops. Now, why in the world did it stop? Well, I think we just read that when we were reading about singing the instructions to sing and make melody in the heart. And you can go through time and you can see that as you're going through time and looking historically, you don't find instrumental music being used by anybody who was calling themselves a Christian. You can get over into probably seven or 800 before the first example of that is used. Uh, you can get over into the second millennium when you have the Greek Orthodox Church splitting off from the Catholic Church. And you know, one of the differences between the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church is at the time of the split, uh, the Catholic Church was not adamantly against instrumental music, but the Greek Orthodox Church was. And even today, the Greek Orthodox Church does not use instrumental music in worship. Now, Thomas Aquinas, who was a Catholic, did some writing in, in A.D. 1250. And this is a, a comment from his, from, Tom, from Bingham's Antiquities, volume 3, page 137. He said, Our church does not use instruments as harps and psalteries to praise God with all that she may not seem to Judaize. So at that date, at least some Catholic churches were still refusing to use musical instruments in worship, and there continued to be enough protest within the Roman Catholic Church that it became a topic in the Council of Trent in 1545. At that time, they had a vote to see whether they were going to allow instruments of music in worship. It was a very close vote, but having it won. And so you got a, a break point there at 1545 where it is legitimized in the Catholic Church. You start moving into the Reformation movement, and you'll find that the early leaders of the Reformation movement were against instrumental music. For example, Martin Luther said, the organ in the worship to God is an ensign to Baal. You know, Baal being a false god. John Calvin said, it is more suitable than the, it is no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of tapers, or revival of other shadows of the law. The Roman Catholics borrowed it from the Jews. It's interesting to me that John Calvin is, the essence of what he's saying is you can't go back to the Old Testament to justify what you're doing in New Testament worship. Charles Spurgeon, who was a Baptist preacher in England, said, I've got several slides from him, he said, praise the Lord with the harp. Israel was at school and used childish things to help her to learn. But in these days, when Jesus gives us spiritual food, one can make melody without strings and pipes. We do not need them. They would hinder rather than help our praise. Sing unto him. This is the sweetest and best music. No instrument like the human voice. This is from one of Spurgeon's commentaries. David appears to have had a particularly tender remembrance of the singing of the pilgrims, and assuredly it is the most delightful part of worship 
and that which comes nearest to the adoration of heaven. What a degradation to supplant the intelligent song of the whole congregation with the theatrical pettiness of a quartet, bellows, and pipes. We might as well pray by machinery as praise by it. Then Spurgeon was a, a preacher for the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle in London, and, and that was a very large group, about 20,000 and they never used any mechanical instruments of music in that service. Uh, he liked that comment about, he made it in, a, in another time when he was asked why he quoted 1 Corinthians 14, 15. He said, I will pray with the Spirit, and I, or the Bible said, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. He then declared this same statement again, I would as soon pray to God with machinery as to sing to God with machinery. And as I said earlier, the instrumental music in worship was part of the Jewish worship when Jesus walked on earth as a man, and that type of worship came to an immediate stop when the church was established on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and this change was what God wanted because in Ephesians 5.19 he said singing and making melody in your heart. All right. Hebrews 13.15, Brother Mormon said is also a, uh, an important complimentary verse to that that points out the same thing. You know, all men who called themselves Christians, obeyed God with respect to singing without instruments of music for hundreds of years. And when people add uh, instrumental music to their so-called worship, I think the following scripture applies. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain... Or, you know, it's worthless. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. It's just amazing to me how recent instrumental music in Christian worship is, relatively speaking. And it's also amazing to me is how we can treat God's commands on that subject as optional or trivial. I go back to the Old Testament to the example of Nadab and Abihu. You know, they had been given instructions about what kind of fire to bring into the tabernacle. And the Bible says what they brought in was strange fire. It was strange because it was different than God's instructions. Now that wasn't a big thing, was it? I mean, it's just what kind of way you're going to carry the fire into the tabernacle. And yet to God, it was a violation of His instructions. And fire came out and consumed Nadab and Abihu. I'm sure great fear came upon everybody. Um, Old Testament is given to us for our learning. We're supposed to learn that God doesn't want us to add to or take from His instructions. Well, a point that uh, Sister 
Martin is uh, talking about here is that back then, if they did bad, God struck them dead or took action immediately. And today he gives us grace and mercy. Well, actually, that's not all true. I mean, there were a lot of times that they sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned and got away with it, sometimes three or four hundred years, and then God would, you know, pull the leash. There were times that Ananias and Sapphira uh, fell dead. Now, if every time we sin, like Ananias and Sapphira did, people fell dead, uh, we'd have a lot of us that are dead. Uh, it, it is good that God is long-suffering with us and wants everybody to repent. But one thing God does not want us to do is disregard His instructions. And that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make. There will be a time of reckoning. You know, sometimes God has reckoned with man while he was still on earth, but we know that all of us are going to stand before God and have to answer for how we followed or did not follow his instructions. Let's move on to verses 22 through 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the blood, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and his flesh and of his bones." For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. What is the wife's responsibility towards her husband, according to what we just read? Submit to her own husband, okay, anything else. Respect her husband. Well, we're just looking at what it says here. Sister Mason said we ought to add love to it, even though it doesn't say that here. I know that the older women was, were told to teach the younger women how to love their children and their husbands. But here he said, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. Now, what's the husband's responsibility towards his wife? He's supposed to love his wife. What else? Lay down your life if you have to. In other words, defend her if you have to. All right, let's see what it says. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. This, as was indicated, implies that he should defend her and be willing to die for her if necessary. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. This, in, this is addressing the intensity of the love that a husband has for his wife. Now, how did Paul describe the church? Bride of Christ. Any other descriptions you can find there? Glorious. No spot, no wrinkle. 
look at a few of those. He said that Christ died for the church. He said that Christ is the head of the church. He said the church and the body are the same. He said Christ is the Savior of the body of the church. He said that Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. He said he sanctified and cleansed her with the washing of water by the word. And when Christ presents the church to himself, he wants her to be glorious and without spot or wrinkle and holy and without blemish. Now, describe the intensity of a husband's love for his wife. We may have answered that earlier. What did we say? Love it. Their, their, the wife ought to love, the husband ought to love his wife as he does his own body. And this, this question assumes the husband is following Paul's instructions. But he's to love his wife so much that he's willing to die for her. He is to love his wife as much as he loves his own body. And the love that the husbands are to have for their wives is the result of a decision to seek the best for them. It's a choice that the husband makes. It is a decision to help and not hurt, to build up and not tear down, to encourage and not discourage. Men, if we treat our wives like that, life would be a lot better, wouldn't it? Describe how Christ loves the church. Gave his life for it. And that's right. First, Christ gave himself for the church so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. In order to be sanctified... I know I know how to spell must. It doesn't have two S's. One must withdraw or separate from what is unclean, that is, the world, and be set apart for God's holy purpose. The holiness of God's people is often emphasized in the book of Ephesians. Uh, a lot of times Paul spoke of Christians as saints or holy. Second, Christ gave himself for the church so that he might present her to himself in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You know, when you think about this, we have a responsibility to be pure individually and as a congregation. You know, if we just let sin creep into the camp and never address sin... We're going to be moving further and further away from what Christ expects to take with him as his bride when he returns. The term glory carries with it the idea of splendor. The church has a glorious inheritance that we studied about in verse 18 of chapter 1. The church brings glory to God that we studied about in, in chapter 3 and verse 21. And glory is linked to the bride and when you think about that, it, it implies moral perfection. Third, Christ gave himself for the church so that she would be holy and blameless. Holy and blameless was used earlier by Paul in the first chapter to show God's purpose in choosing the Ephesians in Christ before the foundation of the world. Just an observation here. The church is holy and blameless now, not because of just what we do, but it's holy and blameless because of the cleansing made possible by the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross as He gave Himself for her. That's what Christ did, and we stay holy and blameless by walking in the light. That's what we do. And that same blood will continue to cleanse us. What does God expect the relationship between a husband and wife to be? Yeah, he, he went back to that relationship between Christ and the church. You know more two people, you're one. 
It is a loving, nourishing, cherishing, respectful relationship. I think all of those words or some form of those words were used in this discussion. Now then, we're ready to transition to the next part of the outline that starts in chapter 6 about parents and children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now we're going to take the various instructions, and I'd like for us to look specifically at family members in verses 1 through 4. What about children? What were the instructions to children? Obey your parents. What were the rest of those that instruction? In the Lord. All right. To honor also. And it was, that's right. It's the first commandment with promise. Uh, just an observation here about the term in the Lord. Wives and children and slaves are all given instructions. The wives and the slaves are told to submit. The children are to obey, which is really a stronger instruction than submit. And, and several commentaries say that the phrase in the Lord means the children are to obey if the instructions are consistent with the Lord's word. I found Jay Lockhart's comments in Truth For Today commentary to be insightful. He pointed out that the children addressed in Ephesians must have been old enough to understand the instructions given to them. Further, the text seems to imply that they were members of the church. Uh, to be in the Lord, a phrase used elsewhere in Ephesians, must mean to be a Christian. And he commented, and this is from his, his words too, Andrew T. Lincoln summarized the situation by asserting that these children were old enough to be conscious of a relationship to the Lord and to be appealed to on the basis of it, but young enough still to be in the process of being brought up. In other words, the text applies to children who are Christians but still live under the authority of their parents. Now, my wife suggested to me that we consider the pagan environment in which uh, they lived and the influences that were present there in Ephesus. If one parent was, parent was still a pagan and the child could easily be getting instructions contrary to the Lord's will, if this happened, the Christian teenager would not be expected to obey the parent's instructions for, for this child to sin. All right, if you, as we continue with this question, and you look at fathers, let me back up a little bit. What are the instructions to fathers? Don't provoke your children to wrath. All right, that's the negative part. What's the positive part? Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay? Okay. Uh, It's interesting to me that one, one translation says bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. The training is teaching them what to do, and the admonition is teaching them what not to do. Have you ever known a parent that would not use the word no with their children? They'd only tell them positive stuff. They only tell them what to do, but they wouldn't ever say, no, that's wrong. You're only given half the instructions if you only cover the training and leave off the admonition. Why do you think parents are to avoid provoking their children to wrath? This is a bonus question. I'm hearing up here it might prevent them from sinning. 
Why do you think that parents are to avoid provoking their children to wrath? If you make them mad, Sister Stephen says they're not going to listen to anything that you say. Now, now, wrath is a little bit beyond mad. You know, I, I mean, they, you've pushed them over the cliff. And if you push them over the cliff, I think the cutting off of communications is one thing. And, you know, the instructions also to us are be ye angry and sin not. We, we know that if we become intensely angry that we become very vulnerable to falling in a trap of the devil. So as a parent, it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're not going to at times have to instruct your children in things about things that they've done wrong or things that they should not do and and, and sometimes it's going to upset them, but I, I think this extreme word, wrath, has to be uh, kept in mind. It also means that as parents, we need to be sensitive to what our behavior or what our instructions are doing to our children. So there, that, to me, that implies a level of communication and understanding between parent and child. Right. I think we're at a, a break point right here. I had planned to go on to, to verse 9, and we we're going to start with bond servants and masters next week, the Lord willing. I'd like for you to make a translation and translate that to our day, and we'll, we'll try to make this apply to employers and employees. Thank you all very much.